excuse me, totally uh, what the breakdown was for the men. But for women, we have conveniently these times on this beautiful vertical TV. And I'm grateful because I'm going to talk to you about times and how you look at time. So um, I don't know if the camera is able to catch all the numbers, so I'll walk you through the numbers. So up top, we've got Dagenhart, Rosenthal. Uh, I mean, they were world champions last week, so we could have guessed this. But at the end of a run, this is what an athlete looks at. So they have all the splits. Um, this is the start time. And then there's different timing eyes throughout the track. So. And when an athlete comes and looks at this, first you want to check your start time. So I'm American, so let's look at the Americans. So uh, we'll look at um, Foregun Kirkby. So they pulled a 5.9. That was a third place start. That's pretty good. That's pretty awesome. You want to be pulling for sure within top five, top three starts. And then you can see it, the, the timing eye. They were in third place, third place, third place, and then they dropped this to sixth place. So then they'll look at the timing eye. They'll say, okay, between 24 and 33 seconds, um, that was about, do you need me to move? Oh, no, you're fine. Okay, they were pointing at the screen, and I didn't know if I was in their way. So they'll look at the splits, and they'll say, okay, we dropped three places at this point, so where in the track is that? I'm going to guess that's around 13, 14, 15, so then they can think, okay, did we make a mistake there? What happened there? Because once you make a mistake, it's really hard to come back from it. Like, once you lose the momentum, you, it, the race is kind of over. You can't, the track's not long enough to, like, gain momentum back. So they'll look at this. Third, six ways, six ways, ended up in seventh place. So you kind of look at these numbers and think, okay, where did I make mistakes? What happened? Now, let's look at the Germans on the other hand. This is very German-like. Um, so they pulled a second place start. Germans have fast starts. They're just really strong. Um, but this is what happens. So they're in second, they're in second, and then they're in first, first, first for the last four splits. That usually is due to knowing a track super well. So Jessica Dagenhart, this is her home track. She knows it, like the back of her hand. Um, and so they know how to drive. So you'll normally see Germans like make up time as they go down the track. It's rare that they will bleed time. So we'll see bleeding time from some of the other countries that aren't as familiar. Um, so for anyone that's watching the show, you can take a look at these times and this is how you'll break down time. So athletes look at this during the, the week as well. So like you, they'll, they'll send out emails of, of the track times of other countries because you're not sliding with everybody, right? You have your own session and they'll look, they'll say, okay, I'm usually as fast as this girl. Uh, how fast did she go? Where did she make her mistakes? And then you'll look at your times and think, where did I make my mistakes? So uh, a start is super important for these women. They want to be pulling under six seconds. Um, but if they make a big mistake in start curve, then they'll drop back. So anyways, this is a breakdown of times. Just uh, Dagenhart, Rosenthal, they're leading by a tenth. And then Aigle and Kip, they're back by 1,500. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty hefty lead, I would say. But Altenburg... Uh, it's not really a speed track, it's a driving track. So if this was a speed track, like if we were in Eagles and that was the lead, it would be kind of game over. But because this is a driving track, things can be a little different. So uh, this is our breakdown. We're very familiar with this. Germany, Italy, Austria, they've collected most of, they've collected most of the medals this season. So we're not surprised. So, um, so anyways, that's a little bit of timing breakdown. Um, I asked a guest to come join us. Come join me over here, Alex. Come on this side with me. So this is Alex Ferlazzo, Australia. G'day. There he is. Um, I was just doing a little bit of breakdown on times. Yeah. How do you break down times? Like, how do you look at a timesheet? Well, first of all, we look at the start time, and then uh, we compare that to the, the next split, which is the next split shows you the momentum you're making down the track from the start, right? And then from then on, it's just um, comparing the splits along the way to see where you lost time or gained time down the track and then ultimately the finish time tells all but yeah you can learn a lot from the starts especially if you um put them into a like a graph and you can really see like where you gain speed or lost speed in different sections or like a number of sections you can really get into it if you'd like to Wait, what is this graph tell me more about this graph yeah you like you input all, all, your, all your times and you compare it to another athlete and then um and then it like puts in a you know like a, a line like a worm and then you <laughs> and you get to see where you lost gained it's just makes it really easy to read like straight away without just like having to read the numbers back and forth but that's really smart i've never thought so it creates a line graph and then you compare it so 
So who have you compared your starts to? I assume you've done this for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So in Oberhof, I was training with the Germans and I just always compared my run with the fastest German at the time. Like the fastest, yeah, the fastest athlete in that training session. Yeah. So you, you'd put in all their splits and then you would see where they were faster. Okay. So I was just talking about how it's common for Germans to pick up speed on their way down. It's common for other countries where they're not as familiar to kind of bleed time. So did you see like the Germans slowly, gradually building or what did their graph look like? Well, depending on the run, right? And I have a really good idea of how fast and how good my run was. I'm not sure how theirs went, but it, uh, it, tells, it tells a nice story of, um, you know, if, which sections are faster for you and where, what you're doing well and where you're not doing well. Yeah, it helps that's a bit. So smart. Um, okay, let's move away from these times because that's not a very good looking backdrop. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm actually really stoked to talk to you because uh, this is what you need to know about Alex. Um, an incredible driver, an incredible athlete. Australia, obviously not the country we think of to, to be in sliding sports, but you, I, I've been talking to Duncan a lot. Duncan Kennedy is his coach and he used to be my coach. I love DK, he's great. And he just raves about how talented you are on a sled. And it's so cool, because I feel like for some of the smaller nations, it's not really about like being fast. They're just trying to kind of survive, but you're, you're in a really special, part where you're talented enough to where you're like I could push for top 10 top five if I really wanted to but then you're coming from a country with no resources so can you break down how this all works for you I mean I, I picked up the sport pretty quickly and I was I had a good feeling from it right away and uh, you know it took a long time to, to learn the driving and learn the tracks but now I'm finally at a point where I feel it's not so much about the driving perfect lines and it's about really trying to gain speed on all the tracks, right? So like this season, for instance, I've, um, I've crashed twice and both crashes uh, have been in races when I'm really pushing it, right? And I'd rather crash in a race pushing it than um, just be slow, not, you know, trying to make it down safely. Pushing it means for people that don't yeah. get that. What, yeah. What's pushing it for you? It can mean a few different things, like maybe, you know, lowering an angle or changing something on the sled or um, really just pushing position and going it, going through transitions with confidence, like really trusting an exit and so lying back and trying to absorb the next corner as, as well as you can. You can gain a lot of speed in luge by pushing back and absorbing pressures and using using the g-force on the way down and that's that's the difference between the the, the good fast athletes and the, the not so you just athletes. you just changed like a whole perspective in my brain yeah i mean it's been eight years since i've done this sport and i so i i'm coming at it with what i knew but the germans talk a lot about this and i've never really understood what it meant yeah. so gaining speed because like here is a perfect example so altenberg is flat at the top so uh, when it's flat at the top, any little mistake is going to cost you big time. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, this, I mean, this is nuggets. I should have known this when I was sliding. So if I'm hearing you correctly, like it's about how you absorb those curves at the top instead of actually driving them correctly. Yeah. It's not so much about line. I mean, lines comes first, but once you have the lines nailed, then it's about pushing back and using the pressures in each corner, right? Like you might, some corners, even a labyrinth corner, like you just be on it for a second, but instead of just like getting on and just trying to force the sled through, you try to like push back further into the pressure and you can feel a push off the corners. So in every entrance and exit, if you can really push back and relax more, you get little pushes all the way down the track. And it, the first time you feel this, it it's just like mind blowing and it's like, oh, okay, that's how people are fast, right? The, the more you can do that down a track, the better you can be, right? Like, like in Oberhof, for instance, last week, I was, you know, focusing on a few corners here and there, like six was a big one, out of five, out of eight, just places where you can really develop a bit of speed. But, you know, that's why home track advantage is so, so huge because they're able to get these pushes and generate the speed on every entrance and exit on, every corner down the track and that's how they build speed all the way down which is wild to think about so you don't even have a home track yeah. and yet like for anyone that's been following the season you won nations in segulda which which you don't just casually win the qualifier i mean you could that could potentially we've had medal contenders like that puts you up 
like in an upper tier of this. So like how just I just don't understand how like you're still here and competitive and doing so incredibly well. Well, I've been I've been traveling on the circuit for a while now, and I really do feel like this is like the first year where I've been confident on a number of tracks. I mean, there's still a few that I'd like more runs on. This is one of them. I'm just honestly just trying to survive for the way down every run at the moment. This is a terrifying track for me, but we hope to change that by Worlds next year. But I'm um, like Segulda, for instance, is my is my home track. I train with the Latvians for for three years, so it's it is where I've had the most runs and where I can trust all the or trust all the corners to develop speed on the way down, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's so for for anyone that doesn't know, for these smaller countries, they that don't have like a whole federation, they'll train with different countries. So it sounds like you've taken all the goods from each, which is the best way to do it. But most times, athletes will burn out, at least from what I've seen, because like any Team GB athletes we've had or. Um, I'm trying to think of who else like there it, it's just hard it's a, a it's a hard sport in general and then it's hard to get the support that you need and so I'm really just excited for you and everything that's happening and Duncan uh, his coach was talking about just all the things you're working with on a sled and he's just like a wizard and so passionate so I feel like all of the vibes are coming together for you I, I do too and in more ways than you might think like Duncan he built my sled before I was working with him now so I've been I've been on his equipment for what three years now but now this is the first year I've actually like you know worked day in and day out on the sled and how, and I give him good feedback of how it's feeling and what can change and now we're really rolling towards something impressive coming up. Yeah. So cool. So really quick for anyone watching, what do you like to do outside of sliding? Like if you weren't sliding, what would you be doing? What would I be spending a lot of time at the beach and fishing and camping. I don't know, all things Australia outside, honestly. Um, yeah, catching, just catching fish. Because are you in a perpetual <laughs> winter? Because you go home it's winter when the season's done, right? Kind of? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what most people think, and I like to let them think that. But I'm from North Queensland, Townsville, so winter is the best time of the year to be there. It's warm. It's like 25 degrees Celsius during the day. Like, it's a beautiful time to be there. So I'll let people think I'm in winter all year round, but really, I get the best of both. It kind of adds to your story. Like, it adds to the grind. You're like, I'm in an endless... I'm <laughs> also, fish, what, what kind of fish? What kind of? Are you fly fishing? Are you deep sea? Like, what does that mean? All, all, all types of fishing, right? We spend a lot of time on the reef, the Great Barrier Reef, so we do a lot of reef fishing, deep sea fishing, you know, barramundi fishing, yeah. Wait, what was that? What a what a? It's a barramundi. It's like... It's like a bit of a game estuary fish, like a, like bass fishing in America, I guess, but Australian edition. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Can you say that word one more time? Barramundi. Barramundi. Barramundi, yeah. Okay, Barramundi. Also, just casually, we fish on the Great Barrier Reef. Like, <laughs> like that, there's, that's just in your backyard. How far, where do you live exactly in Australia? I live in Townsville, so like far north Queensland, up in the tropics, on the reef. Like, it's a... It's a bit of a trek to get out to the reef, like you sit on a boat for an hour and a half to get out there. But once you're there, you spend all day and it's beautiful and yeah, you're on the reef. Is there surf up there? If you're lucky, like a cyclone needs to like creep in around the reef, but we surf further south. Like I, I have a camper van and I drive down south and go surfing when I can. Yeah. You know, I'm really happy for you and all your success in sliding, but that sounds like the life. Yeah. Like, that yeah. really kind of sounds yeah. it. I'm, tr I'm, truly, I'm really trying to balance these two worlds right now, and I'm doing a good job so far. Yeah, and a balanced athlete, Alex Ferlazzo, thank you so much. Um, such a cool story. Thank you. You're doing incredible. So everybody, now it's so important we want to give the story to the athletes because the fans don't really know mm -hmm. who everybody is, and, and so now you know who to root for because really it's incredible that he's doing so well and... You're really, when Duncan pointed it out, like he's such a talented driver. Now I'm watching and I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's so, you just look incredible on a sled, which was the compliment I always wanted to hear. So now I'm just yeah. gonna give it to you that you, you look, so you. would you wanna give anything for anyone watching at home? Any cool, is there any cool slang that you, I don't know. We slang. usually, yeah, we usually say oh, in man, your- It's so hard to like just think of slang right off the top of the head. I don't know. We usually say, you say something to the fans at home in your language, but your language is English, right. so really, you could, you could say anything you want. All right, well, hello everyone back home. It's uh, I'll be there in about three weeks, looking forward to going to the pub, grabbing a few skewies, and uh, getting on the reef and catching some barramundi. Let's get, let's get it. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, we've got Athlete of the Week coming up in just a second. Alex Frazzo, thank you. Um, he just, 
Incredible. Um, Athlete of the Week coming up in just a second. We talked to Jessica Dagenhart. She's currently leading the race, so it's very perfect and appropriate. But yeah, coming up in a, in a second.